All right. Uh, welcome back to the, the locker room. Uh, again, today we're going to take on another topic today. Uh, we're going to focus on, on uh, alcohol and, and more specifically kind of get to maybe some lessons we can learn uh, from alcohol. You know, how, how does it work? What's it doing to our body? Is it healthy? There's a lot of controversy around this right now uh, with, you know, some studies that come out over the last uh, three years or so indicating, you know, th this whole thought that maybe one to two drinks a day uh, is good for us, healthy for us, lowers our risk of, of certain diseases may not be accurate, that we may not have the full picture of alcohol. And in fact, you know, people are now state, uh, stating that no alcohol uh, is, is good for you. Obviously, the more you take, the higher it elevates your risks for uh, bad outcomes and illness and disease. Um, so is this idea uh, perhaps that, uh, you know, one or two drinks is good because it helps us to relax, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a bit of a false narrative. Um, and the fact that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go to alcohol saying, all I need to do is relax, you know, and it's good for me, right? Uh, that then we will go to alcohol as sort of uh, that, that tool uh, to allow us to relax with the construct that it's actually good for us, it's healthy for us, which again, you know, that, that, that may be false. Uh, we're, that's what we're gonna uh, kind of take uh, a look at. So again, we're gonna do this under the lens of threat versus safety. And we won't really talk too much about safety physiology. We're going to focus more on, on what happens to us under threat. So we're going to run the threat column again uh, just for reinforcement. So when we talk about threats, we have physical threats. So things like prions, viruses, bacteria, lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my, toxins, okay? So alcohol can fall under this category of uh, toxin. And we got guns and cars and other people. And we also have our spiritual threats, our emotional threats or injuries, trauma, uh, social uh, threats, injury and, and trauma. And I always like to point out when people go, well, what is that? that that's things like isolation, uh, maybe overcrowding can be part of that too. Um, but uh, things like discrimination, disenfranchisement, injustice fall into this category, Fas uh, financial uh, threat, injury, trauma, uh, poverty uh, is a big threat to us and activates our threat physiology, right? And, and then some of the intellectual stuff that we refer to, some of the constructs that we create, uh, you know, are, are sort of uh, 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 negative thoughts that turn into negative uh, stories or false narratives can be a threat to us. And obviously, in these categories, people, people can uh, inv uh, 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 inflict physical uh, 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 threat, uh, uh, trauma, injury, as well as spiritual. And then we get down into the shadow uh, threats, the genetics, the instincts that have been passed forward to us that uh, um, you know, keep us a little bit anxious and hypervigilant sometimes. Epigenetic stuff, this is transgenerational uh, coding of our, uh, of our, our, our genetic code um, so that trauma in past generations can be passed forward to the next generation. Um, but also we do it based on our experience as we recode our DNA throughout our lifetime. We also create wiring in our brain of predictive codes uh, that um, can bias us towards threat and keep our threat physiology going. We can have traumatic memories that I put in the shadows because by and large, they're out of awareness, but occasionally they'll bubble up to awareness when we are awake. Uh, and, and frequently they'll kind of bubble up uh, into dreams that we might remember or recall. Um, then we can also uh, do thought suppression and that energy doesn't go away. It sits in there and, and, and pokes our threat button and we can get into emotional repressions that can very much impact our threat physiology. So we just kind of ran that list. We're gonna do a quick review of uh, some anatomy focusing on the brain here. Um, so uh, we're gonna start um, up at the top here uh, in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, okay? This is part of the new cortex. This is di very distinctly human in its, in, in, in its uh, sort of size in particular. 
Um, and this is the part of the brain that allows us to reason, to plan, uh, 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 execute judgment, and have some creativity. Um, and then uh, kind of in, in this same prefrontal or neocortex part of the brain, we also have the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And this is very much responsible for our ability to connect with one another, uh, feel empathy and, and bond. So there's a, a big you know, social component uh, to that part of the prefrontal cortex. In here, kind of you know, uh, on the inside, not on the outside, um, and just a little bit above the, the ventral uh, prefrontal cortex, we just have the, the medial prefrontal cortex. And this is where we house a lot of this stuff the need to, have to, must, should, you know, social calculations, social norms, and social constructs exist in there. So that, that's the frontal cortex, and, and, and as I said, it's, it's the neocortex in humans, uh, and it's very distinct in us in its size and, in, and its function. Um, and so I want to point out here that it's kind of this prefrontal cortex area where we create constructs. We can actually, in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, we can create constructs like this crazy board, right? Or a construct of how to build a skyscraper. Or we can uh, create uh, constructs and stories about our own self. It may not be true, we create them. Uh, and we can uh, create these guys down here, uh, kind of the social constructs that were handed to us from the time we were born of how we should be, right? What we, if we're a, a good person, a successful person, you know, uh, 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 a kind person even, what does that look like? We get that through, you know, sort of constructs, but they're just constructs. They're, they're, they don't necessarily reflect reality, and we tend, but we tend to agree on them, right? We, we agree on the constructs as a, as a society, as a culture, uh, and, and so they become effectively our reality. And I, I think that's something, you know, really important to keep in mind. Okay, now we're gonna go a level below to the part of the brain I always call the, the paleocortex or the older cortex. It's more common to, you know, most mammals and animals uh, in, its, in its structure. So in here we have um, the, uh, the, the cingulate cortex running uh, front to back. And this is the area that is uh, responsible for uh, things like emotions and, uh, and processing of emotions, uh, you know, sort of learning uh, memories of emotions. And we would typically characterize this because this is, this is conscious, right? We're aware of the functions that are going on in here. So we would typically characterize these as, as feelings, you know. Our emotions, our, our feelings, poking on us, uh, sensory uh, type stuff, you know, hot and cold is also a feeling, but it goes up here into the, into the sensory cortex. And then we go down kind of, you know, further deeper into the brain, uh, into the uh, insular cortex. And this is, this, we also get a, a, a sense of our self here and, and, and uh, uh, our emotional feelings are also housed in there in part, but this is where our viscera, uh, visceral sensations get housed. You know, it's like, uh, you know, if you're sad and you're sick to your stomach or whatever, that they're gonna be housed in here. So that, that's kind of, we're going down the layers of the cortical brain, okay? Now, let's go, let's go back uh, over here and, and we're gonna work just upward for just a second. If we get down into the brainstem, down into the medulla, down in here, we have these little nuclei that set our, uh, our parasympathetic tone, that set our sort of relaxation uh, you know, uh, response and, and are, are involved in breed and feed and rest and digest type stuff and control our heart rate and our respiratory rate and things like that. They're way down here. And they have a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, that goes with them. And then if we go up a little further up the brain, we get into the, this little kind of cluster of nuclei uh, in, 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 the, in the brain stem, uh, up, up around the midbrain and the, and the transition uh, further up into the brain. And so we have the raphe nucleus where, where we uh, had a lot of serotonin stored. So serotonin in general is felt to be a feel-good neurotransmitter, more associated with you know, breed, feed, and digest and rest type physiology. Um, and then uh, here we have the locus ceruleus. So this is, uh, has a high concentration of 
norepinephrine or noradrenaline. So it, it keeps us awake, it stimulates us. It's in general a feel-good neurotransmitter until its level gets too high and its cousin adrenaline or epinephrine gets too high and then we get a little jittery and anxious with, with, uh, uh, with norepinephrine. And then above it in here we have a couple of nuclei uh, that house dopamine, okay? So dopamine is, is in general a feel-good neurotransmitter and it stimulates us to move, okay? So it, uh, it, it uh, stimulates us even to approach other people to stand upright and, and, uh, and to do something. So it's also very much because it's a feel-good neuro neurotransmitter involved in our reward system. Um, and so that, that's housed right in here and I, I want to point out that the dopamine runs through this kind of system here. Uh, the, the striatum goes all the way up uh, to the nucleus accumbens up here. And, that, and, and at that level, it has a really high integration uh, with our neocortex, our, our um, prefrontal cortex uh, is, is highly influenced by, by dopamine, okay? Um, so that's kind of a... You know, just a, a, a quick rundown uh, of the brain. I just want to talk about what happens under threat before I completely jump into alcohol. So when we're under threat, we're going to do some resource allocation and we're going to prioritize certain functions in our body for the fight and flight, you know, from the run from the tiger type deal. And the things that are a big priority for us in fight or flight are fuel. We need a lot of fuel for that and certain um, you know, organ systems. So we need our heart to be working, we need our lungs to be working, we need our diaphragm to be working, uh, and we need our, our skeletal muscles to be uh, uh, working. So we're gonna devote more resources, more blood flow, more fuel to that part of our body, okay? Um, and what we, what we also do though, is at the same time we have to we have to you know rob Peter to pay Paul so uh, we're gonna take resources away uh, from certain parts of our body that aren't important for the fight or flight so so one of the areas that we that we take away from is the neocortex okay uh, because you know this animals can survive on all this stuff right easily they don't they don't use all this stuff we use this you know to sort of function and use our, our highly advanced cognitive abilities, our highly advanced language and symbol ability, our highly advanced social skills. We use that uh, all the time for, you know, for, for uh, uh, living sort of, you know, a uh, uh, healthy, successful, and connected life. Um, but in a fight or flight with a tiger, you know, you don't do a lot of planning. You do a lot of reacting, right? You gotta move, you gotta do something. You know, you, you, you don't necessarily need uh, to spend time contemplating and, and, and going through a judgment process. We do a lot more prejudging. We're much more prejudicial in that way as well. Um, it's not time to do calculus or invent the wheel when the tiger's on your back. So those things kind of go offline. Um, the other thing too is this, this part of the brain um, goes off line as well uh, where you know we don't need to connect with the tiger we don't need to have empathy we're not going to bond we're not going to mate with the tiger let's turn that off in the fight and flight okay and then let's go to the medial prefrontal cortex the need to have to must should social calculations completely useless in a, in, in a tiger fight you don't want to be second guessing yourself geez you know if i if i smack the tiger in the nose he may not like me, I might not get invited to his birthday party kind of thing. You know, that, that's not relevant in a fight or flight. So this is gonna go offline. We're going to eventually in the fight, of, fight or flight, as it gets more extreme, uh, that, that we will um, start turning off some of these other uh, functions as well. You know, uh, the, the cingulate cortex will eventually uh, downregulate, but later, uh, the uh, insular cortex will do the same, okay? And then we get uh, down here even further into the fight when, uh, when we're clearly losing, where, you know, our movement system starts to shut down on us. You know, we were talking about dopamine, it gets us to move. It's very involved in, in, in getting us to do stuff. 
Well, it'll even start to shut down and, uh, and our serotonin will drop. Uh, and as we get really deep into it, our, you know, our parasympathetic system will drop, our acetylcholine uh, connections will, will also drop, okay? So you can see with threat, you know, I made this huge, overly exaggerated uh, prefrontal cortex, but we're gonna have sort of this gradual uh, dissolution uh, is a way to term it, or a gradual dissociation uh, as we move uh, away from cortical function towards more automatic functions and, and limbic functions, uh, and eventually sort of gravitating more down into even just basic brainstem functions if we decide we need to curl up in a ball and hide from the tiger and be very quiet and not move. We might even pass out in a bad tiger fight. We, we may get all the way down so that this whole stuff's kind of down-regulated and we're just you know, modulating our, our, our respiratory rate and our heart rate to keep us uh, alive, but at a very low uh, kind of metabolic rate, but also low heart rate, low respiratory rate, uh, low temperature, we'll be very quiet. So that's kind of a quick rundown on how we react to threat. Okay, so let's, let's get over here and, and let, let's talk a little bit about uh, alcohol. Um, and uh, I think I'd like to first talk about sort of the, the stages of intoxication. And just by the term intoxication, we've already kind of said, hey, this, this is a toxin, right? Uh, we don't always think of it that way when we think of it as being good for us at a certain level, but intoxication. So, so uh, let's, let's talk about uh, kind of you take that first sip. You're, you're still sort of sober, right? You're, you know, you don't really feel much of an effect of it. But after you have a couple more sips, you start to get a little euphoric. What is that? Okay. Uh, what, what, what's, the, what's the euphoria? What's happening there? Uh, and then, you know, if you drink a little bit more, you get a little bit more excitable. You get a little bit more hyperkinetic. You're, you know, you're moving, you're dancing. Um, the combination of the, those two, you tend to exhibit sort of more approach uh, behavior, um, and you might consume a little bit more, and that approach behavior might even turn into a little bit of aggression, uh, and uh, you know, or even hyper uh, sexuality, uh, something like that. Um, so you, you've kind of transitioned just from that, you know, sort of euphoric thing to where there's a little more, bit more uh, kind of movement and, and perhaps aggressiveness. And then as you drink a little bit more, you're going to, you know, move into that state where you're starting to slow down, right? You're, you're now just, a, you know, you're a little bit uh, confused. Um, you know, your, your speech is getting a little slurry. slurry. <laughs> slurry, your, your movements are getting a little bit more uncoordinated and, and, and awkward, um, and you know, your, your cognitive function is really quite poor, right? Your, your executive function is going offline, and, and uh, your memory is getting bad and that type of thing. And then you go a little bit further, have a little bit more, and, and at that point you actually become stuporous, right? You're having trouble just balancing yourself and staying upright, okay? You're starting to feel a little bit woozy. You're not doing a great job of controlling your body movements or even perhaps body functions. Um, and at that point, you might start to feel just a little queasy. You know, you're getting kind of nauseous. You might think you're about to uh, barf, you might be experiencing even a little bit of a sense of vertigo. Uh, and then, you know, if you drink a little bit more, you could actually slip into a coma. And worst case scenario, if you drank more than you can metabolize prior to going into that coma, you can die from alcohol. So think about that. Let's go back up to the board with that process in mind and see what that might look like, okay? So, uh, you know, you, you, I, I, this is why I think actually happens, uh, that explains a lot, is when you take, you know, the first little sip of alcohol and you start turning down your prefrontal cortex, this area becomes super important, okay? This is where 
we get that euphoria. When we, when we turn off this medial prefrontal cortex with alcohol, when we turn off the need to, have to, must, should, all of these social calculations, social norms, and social constructs that we've been given that we are, inhibit us you know, throughout our lives, uh, that, that's a significant event. When we turn off that part of our brain, we actually feel good. Why would we feel good? Well, it, it's in a tug of war with this nucleus accumbens, right? This nucleus accumbens full of dopamine and it's going move, 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 you know, whatever, dance, sing, uh, laugh, uh, uh, you know, just go for it, you know, live your life. Uh, and, and we're inhibiting it with this medial prefrontal cortex and we take some booze and we literally knock off that tug of war. We knock off that tug of war and we allow our emotional um, centers moving up from the, the neurotransmitter level, level sort of through the striatum to the nucleus accumbens, all of a sudden we've been disinhibited and we're moving freely. We're expressing our emotions freely and we go, oh my God, I got that medial prefrontal cortex off my back. I feel great. And you can imagine how reinforcing that could be uh, and, uh, and uh, addicting, okay? But that feels good. You know, that's kind of the euphoria stuff. But then all of a sudden, you know, we're starting to notice our ability to reason and plan and judge is starting to fade. We're becoming, you know, more uh, prejudicial, more impulsive. Um, you know, our, our thinking is clouded. Our memory isn't as good. And then, even though we think we're, we're really good at connecting in this, this state, this part of us starts to go offline a little bit as well. And, 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 and that's where we can get into, you know, some sort of more asocial behaviors uh, when we're intoxicated. Um, so, um, so the threat thing and what happens in alcohol look exactly the same. Right? They, they're, they're, there's really no different. Now, as you keep drinking and the concentration of alcohol goes up, well, your threat load's going up with that concentration of this toxin in your body, and eventually, you know, uh, all these emotions that are now freely flying through, now all of a sudden you're starting to get, you know, kind of uh, uh, shut down in, in the cingulate cortex, and, and so you're going to actually eventually see sort of the dulling of the emotions and the slowing down of that emotional expression. Um, and you might even experience, you know, whereas up here you were happy and giddy and you had a lot of dopamine, you know, here you might actually, you know, feel more down and depressed. And, you know, people might, uh, when they're getting to this point, just even uh, spontaneously start crying. Okay. And then eventually you're going to start losing your visceral sense and you're gonna start losing that sense of yourself. And you're gonna feel sort of profoundly dissociated from, from the world when you know, the, uh, the insular cortex starts to uh, shut itself, or we start to shut down the insular cortex, okay? Now, eventually, we get down you know, kind of into the midbrain level where that starts to shut down. We start down-regulating neurotransmitters. Things are starting to get pretty slow. And then as, the, as we get more and more intoxicated, uh, we may, uh, you know, uh, uh, first start by just uh, lowering our respiratory, lowering our heart rate, lowering our blood pressure, lowering our metabolic rate. But eventually this gets discombobulated as well. And we can start seeing, you know, irregular respirations and we can start seeing, seeing arrhythmias and the brainstem isn't functioning as well. And it's, and it, and it's in this area as well that we have uh, uh, a sensory system for toxins, okay? And, and that's in our nausea center, way down in our medulla and our brainstem. So that's, that's why uh, when, the, when the concentration of a toxin gets to a certain level, we start getting pretty nauseous and, and, and we'll, we'll start vomiting. You know, part of that is a reflex to whatever is the toxin perhaps that we've ingested is to try to get some of it out of our, our system. So that's a, a nice survival strategy. So 
So you can see that th this is a natural progression a and, uh, or a, uh, a physiologic progression that occurs in us in, in, in almost similar patterns in other forms of, uh, of threat and uh, toxicity. Um, so um, with that, I wanna move on to common, sort of the common theories around alcohol and, and, how, and how it works. So one of the ones that you frequently hear about is that alcohol is GABAnergic. So this is a gamma amino butyric acid, and GABA is felt to be a relaxing neurotransmitter for us. It calms us down. And so, you know, there's studies out there that have indicated that alcohol may stimulate GABAnergic re receptors. That's how it relaxes us. Or alcohol may stimulate the release of GABA, and that's how it relaxes us. Um, and then uh, there's the, the glutamine theory, the, or the glutamate theory, where glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, is responsible for hardwiring and memory and things like that, uh, but it's activating for us. Um, but glutamate uh, is a, uh, part of this picture where alcohol uh, decreases the, uh, the glutaminergic, so to speak, tr neurotransmission. And uh, the theory tends to go that the receptor that glutamate sits on to stimulate stuff gets blocked by alcohol. And so we get an inhibitory effect uh, from this uh, glutamate phenomenon that also relaxes us. But then we go to, you know, sort of the dopamine theory of alcohol where uh, alcohol stimulates a release of dopamine. Um, well, dopamine's activating, okay? Dopamine gets us to move. Dopamine gets us to approach people, approach things, do stuff. Well, how do those two or those three, how do those go together? You know, they, uh, they don't, it doesn't make sense. You know, we've, we've looked at, uh, uh, different pieces of the pie or different parts of the elephant and come up with conclusions that just, they aren't coherent, okay? But we also, you know, hear that serotonin may go up and that's why we feel good. Yeah, we know that uh, uh, serotonin uh, makes us feel good and it helps prevent depression and we say alcohol is a depressant and it blunts serotonin and yet we're, we, we give this theory of uh, alcohol intoxication with high serotonin and then also we go into the sort of the opioid theory that it stimulates the release of our own endogenous opioids that make us feel good. And remember, endogenous opioids are not part of our pleasure reward system. Dopamine is, this is part of our stress system. It you know, helps us tolerate an enormous amount of stress, but it's not uh, part of the pleasure reward system. And these have some significant adverse effects to our long-term physiology. Okay. So can we make any sense of that? Well, I think at a certain level we may be able to. So let's go back here to that euphoric phase that we were talking about. If we inhibit the medial prefrontal cortex, okay, and this stuff, the need to, have to, must, should have, all the, the social constructs that we've been given uh, in, in life are turned off, and that disinhibits this system here, okay, it disinhibits this system here that we were talking about that, that, that's got a high amount of dopamine in it, we're gonna feel good. And so we could make the argument that uh, alcohol isn't directly stimulating any of these uh, specific receptors. What it is doing is it's, it's modulating our stress response by turning off this chatter in our head. Um, and, uh, and that results in a, in, in a kind of a flush of feel-good neurotransmitters. But we must remember that it's doing it through a, a, a toxic response. A response to threat is what's turning this off. And that's why that, that moment, you know, maybe the one to two drink uh, area is, is transient. But after that, we go into just classic threat response. And if you look at people who consume high amounts of alcohol long term, what, what do they have? Well, they have very poor GABAnergic activity, okay? Their glutamate system is jacked, okay? They're, they're, they're hyper kind of uh, toxic in some ways. Their dopamine system is depleted. It's turned off. Serotonin's down. 
And the endogenous opioids may actually, in fact, uh, stay elevated because they're part of a threat response. They're part of a stress response. So we have a way to explain, uh, you know, this, this uh, um, uh, incoherence of what you know what we see typically in the literature and the way to pull it together is going through the the progression of a threat response in this case to a toxin and how that might uh, appear in our bodies so some of the other stuff that just you know kind of goes along with that is if we get down into a molecular and cellular level what does alcohol do what do toxins tend to do you know, at a cellular level, we're going to see our mitochondria go through fission. You know, they're going to change configuration. They're going to stop doing oxidative phosphorylation under threat. They are going to uh, stop performing uh, fatty acid oxidation as well. You know, so we're not going to uh, we're not going to chew up our fatty acids or our mobilized fat very much, and you know, therefore, you're going to get a beer belly. And ultimately, if you can't mobilize this stuff and it's got to go someplace, and your fat cells don't want any more of it, you're going to put it into your liver, and you're going to have alcoholic fatty liver, which we should recharacterize just to say threat fatty liver, because fatty liver disease is just threat uh, down the road. Okay. So what we end up seeing, you know, kind of over time is more of a chronic uh, uh, state of, uh, of dissolution or dissociation or impairment or degeneration uh, in, in our bodies with things like a more permanent loss of executive function, more permanent loss of, of inhibition and social graces, and more permanent loss of the ability to connect and empathize, and, and uh, you know, more permanent loss of even motor skills and coordination, um, uh, you know, uh, memory, declarative memory in particular. Um, and then with threat physiology, the other stuff we sent, tend to see as well is things like hypertension and cardiovascular disease and arrhythmias and hypertriglyceridemia and elevated liver function tests. And, and when we talk about liver function tests, we go, that's toxic, that, that's alcohol's toxicity in the liver, uh, and uh, absolutely correct. Uh, but, uh, you know, we also have to conceptualize what's going on metabolically, why that is. You know, this is a, a hyperglutamate state, okay, a hyperglutamate state. And so the enzymes in the liver that help to take uh, glutamine to glutamate are upregulated in, in this state. And those are the exact liver function elevations that we see. In fact, when we get into this, uh, this kind of mitochondrial function here, we change our metabolism substantially and we stop producing uh, GABA and preferentially shunt uh, glutamine to glutamate. And, and, and then we block glutamate being able to go to GABA. We, it, it, alcohol keeps us in a threat state by jacking our glutamate system and blocking our GABA system. Very different than the story we started out with, okay? So that's important. So how does all this happen? Well, you know, when we talk about threat, we have to have threat signalers. And we talked about things that can be threat signalers. And in general, uh, you know, kind of at a, at a very primitive level, we think of when uh, cells are, are, are damaged, they break into bits and pieces. And so you have, you know, things like glycoproteins and lipopolysaccharides and nucleic acids and, you know, bits and pieces of cells floating in the environment. So those bits and pieces of cells signal to our other cells, whoa, something's wrong here, okay? So, so in general, we have threat signalers. So it, with alcohol, you know, uh, ingestion, our threat signalers aren't those typical, you know, what we always call molecular patterns or damps or pamps or things like that, um, that signal danger. It, you know, the alcohol it, it itself um, it can be more of a direct signaler even prior to cell damage that there's a toxin in, in the environment. So we've got the threat signaler to activate the threat pathway and cause this uh, uh, progressive intoxication or as I like to say, the progressive dissociation or kind of shutting down of, uh, of uh, brain structures. Um, 
So alcohol toxins will stimulate the release from our cells of the, uh, of the threat cytokines. And typically we're thinking of interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-2, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, particularly the latter two in the case of alcohol, but there's multiple threat signalers uh, of which this, the threat cytokines are very representative of that. And we know for a fact that, you know, when these guys are elevated, what do we see? When they're elevated, these guys are the guys who are pulling all these switches. These are the guys who are keep increasing inflammation in our arteries. These are the guys that are talking to the mitochondria and going, you know, go into fission, stop oxidative phosphorylation, start glycolysis uh, for, you know, for your metabolism. We're under threat. And that all directly relates to declining brain function, cardiovascular disease, central obesity, metabolic syndrome, um, you know, alcoholic hepatitis, whatever you want to call that, alcoholic fatty liver. Um, we also know that these guys directly influence these brain stem structures. They turn off dopamine production. They turn off serotonin production. They shunt them down the kinurenic pathway instead and make hyperinflammatory chemicals. Um, they, they're responsible for uh, decreasing our parasympathetic tone or our, our breed, feed, digest, and rest tone. These guys are all responsible for that. They, uh, you know, they influence the mitochondria to, to uh, switch gears and they block our ability uh, to metabolize our, our fats and that can push us down the road towards obesity and they are responsible. These guys are directly responsible for insulin resistance so they can uh, create uh, type 2 diabetes in us. So anyway, I think those are the, the things that we you know, need to keep in mind that alcohol teaches us a lot about physiology of threat if we pay attention to it. And, and, and some of the most important things actually I want to bring out after we, we've gone all the way down into the weeds, number one is this. This medial prefrontal cortex and the dialogue it's constantly having with us, um, instantaneous relief from that is alcohol, right? Okay, so what are the other things that we can do to get out of this headspace? Instead of using a toxin, what are the other things we can do? Well, some of these things are right over here, okay? If, we, if we're participating in so, safe social groups, right, that helps us get out of our head. It helps to re-fortify these parts of our brain and get out of kind of that, that head space. Now, if we don't feel safe socially, it's a totally different matter, right? If we're all worried about this stuff, it's a totally different deal. The other thing, when we shut this off, it goes down here and it shuts down, we're, we're more vulnerable, we're more expressive. It actually does shut off our tendency to suppress and repress, suppress negative thoughts and repress our adverse emotions. That goes away so we feel better. So what are, you know, what are the, some of the things that we can do here that don't involve consuming a toxin to disconnect these two, right? Well, my contention is if suppression and repression are the problem, expression is the solution. So we need to, you know, be more free to verbally express ourselves, even if, even if it's to a mirror, right? We need to dance. We need to sing. We need to move. We need to do expressive writing. All of those types of things help to get rid of this, okay? And, and then the other thing is if our predictive codes are wired towards you know, threat, uh, we need to, you know, develop, rebuild some good predictive codes that take us out of threat. And unfortunately with alcohol, you know, when we're taking the first sip of alcohol, there's not a predictive code of major threat. There's a predictive code of this is going to feel good, you know, at least for two drinks maybe, uh, you know, and so we don't have that trepidation like, you know, I'm you know, like, let's say we're bungee jumping, right? You know, you have this, oh, this might not feel so good, but I'm gonna do it because it might be really cool. We don't really have a, ne a major negative predictive code with alcohol until after the fact, till we wake up the next morning, okay? So uh, the lessons learned are, this is what we gotta deal with. Now, most people would go, 
Well, you know, you didn't mention mindfulness because if we're not in this headspace, if we're being mindful, if we're being in the present moment, uh, you know, this, this is going to be a little bit more free. And I'm not discounting that. I just happen to actually believe that this and this, or expression and safe social connection, are more important than, uh, than practicing uh, mindfulness and, and meditation. I think those are actually excellent tools to deal with uh, some of this, this chronic chatter that's coming out of the medial prefrontal cortex, okay? Um, and there's other things that we can do in terms of good nutrition uh, and exercise. So, finally, with that, a, trans a segue, transition from predictive codes, uh, the morning after, the hangover, what is that, okay? So we all probably have learned at some level that alcohol gets metabolized to an aldehyde, acetaldehyde, and then you know eventually it can be broken down to acetic acid and acetyl-CoA type stuff and, and be used for, for energy, all true, and that this, this aldehyde is sort of a, a uh, residual metabolite that makes us feel crappy and hungover and all that kind of stuff. That may be true, you know, that, that's certainly a possibility. But I will argue if you look at a hangover, that is a pro-inflammatory state, okay? You're tired, you have a headache, you don't have an appetite, you might even be a little nauseous, your body aches, all you want to do is curl up in a ball and sleep. So in this theory of threat, what more likely is causing your hangover is a re residual effect of elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines from the alcohol you consumed the night before. Um, so having and, and then and, and then uh, taking that just another you know step further, you could contemplate the type of stuff that might drop these uh, to help you recover. Uh, faster and you know ibuprofen is going to help on the margin and I don't have time to go into the details of what might you know really work to make make that resolve quicker but uh, I think the hangover is better explained in total all of the physiology of a hangover by these threat uh, cytokines than it is by a metabolite of alcohol that is processed you know relatively uh, quickly Okay, I think that's all we got time for today, uh, but that's just kind of run down on, on alcohol. And again, I want to reemphasize that we need to look at the lessons of alcohol, what it can teach us in terms of a threat response, what it can teach us in terms of this dominant um, medial prefrontal cortex in human, uh, in human beings. Um, and I would just conclude by saying uh, that alcohol is a toxin there is no dose of alcohol that is necessarily good for you. Low doses may allow you to be more social, more vulnerable, more expressive short term, and that might have some slight benefit. But I think we need to look at other ways that we can integrate being uh, socially safe, freely expressive, uh, uh, deconstructing our, our constructs, right? We need to look at those things uh, to feel good, uh, to, uh, to shut this guy off and let this flow more naturally versus actually taking a toxin to do it. That makes no sense to me. So I would stay away from alcohol. Best advice. Thanks.